Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, welcome back. We're on session seven now, which will cover some of the remaining topics in gene expression. Um, and we're gonna go into model organisms. You may notice that this is different from the syllabus that we had at the beginning of the course. Um, the reason for that is I really wanted session eight to be as student directed as possible. So it's going to, session eight will be completely um, devoted to topics that um, you all uh, are interested in. Um, and I've, uh, I've spoken to Shruti and I'm pretty sure she's also going to be available. So um, if you have any questions specific to her research, um, definitely have those ready um, as well. Um, okay, and uh, that will, um, uh, so for today's agenda, we're going to split it into three sessions instead of the usual two. So the first two will be uh, epigenetics and model organisms. And then at the end, uh, I want to devote at least half an hour to talking about session eight and uh, what you're what do you want to cover? Um, okay, so I'm going to go into the first topic now. Um, so um, can anyone tell me what the definition of epigenetics is? <laughs> Isn't that when environmental factors affect gene expression? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Good. I still remember. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so as you can see here, the actual definition of epigenetics has changed um, a few times over the course of the of research in this field um, but it all comes back to um, to the same basic concept which is that um, an epigenetic trait is something that is stable stably heritable uh, and it results from changes um, in a chromosome without alterations uh, in the DNA sequence and it's something that's uh, uh, that's usually signaled for uh, from the environment um, so this is the basic um, pathway of uh, an epigenetic trait. So you start off with an epigenator, which is something that comes from the environment and it triggers an intracellular pathway. Uh, this uh, primes something called the epigenetic initiator, uh, which usually has some kind of sequence recognition feature and it usually has some kind of positive feedback mechanism, meaning that it can sustain itself. Um, and the sequence recognition um, allows it to detect uh, where in the genome this epigenetic change needs to take place. Um, and this um, is, uh, then, uh, the signal then goes to uh, what's called an epigenetic maintainer, which is something that sustains the, the chromatin state. Uh, however, it can, can't initiate um, an epigenetic, epigenetic uh, change. And it also does not have absolute sequence specificity. So some examples of an epigenetic genetic, uh, maintainer are um, histone or DNA modifiers, uh, which uh, we'll talk in, about in a little more detail in a bit, um, and histone variants. Um, and examples of epigenetic initiators include DNA binding factors um, and non-coding RNAs. Um, so this should look familiar. We um, talked about this um, during when we went over post-translational modifications. Um, so histones are undergo uh, post-translational modifications um, that can affect uh, accessibility of the of the associated DNA uh, to RNA polymerase. So um, there are two uh, major types of modifications that can happen to the histone protein, acetylation or methylation. Uh, acetylation is carried out by histone uh, acetyl transferases and they uh, result in the chromatin opening up, which uh, allows for uh, access to, um, to the DNA uh, by RNA polymerase. Uh, and conversely, uh, methylation is carried out by a methyl transferase. The example shown here is PRC2. Um, and this causes the chromatin to condense, uh, blocking access by RNA polymerase. Uh, so uh, when you have stretches of uh, DNA that's um, in the format of open uh, chromatin, that's also referred to as euchromatin. And when it's uh, condensed, uh, that's also referred to as heterochromatin. Uh, so next we're gonna go into non-coding RNA. So um, there are two types of non-coding RNA. There's short chain and long chain. So short chain uh, non-coding RNA refers to uh, silencing RNA or siRNA, uh, microRNA or miRNA and, uh, and PWE uh, interacting or PI RNA. And uh, the other type of uh, non-coding RNA is long chain RNA um, 
or in, uh, in this case, long non-coding RNA. So we talked a little bit about uh, silencing uh, RNA before. Uh, this works very similarly to microRNAs. Um, the main difference between the two is that microRNA is endogenous, or it comes from within the cell, whereas uh, siRNA is exogenous. So it comes from some external source, either um, it can, uh, some examples include viral um, genomes, uh, genomic material or, uh, <clears throat> or uh, manufactured uh, double-strand um, RNA, um, such as, uh, uh, RNA interference. Um, so th this can be done uh, in the uh, in a lab uh, with uh, with an RNAi construct. Um, so um, so just a quick review uh, with silencing uh, RNA. You start off with a long strand of double stranded uh, RNA, which is then um, cut into smaller pieces of nineteen to twenty four uh, nucleotide length by a complex called dicer. Uh, this is then loaded onto a protein called Argonaut, uh, which is part of the RNA-induced silencing complex, or RIST. Um, so uh, this is a nuclease complex, which then seeks out uh, mRNA that is um, complement uh, that's um, complementary to um, to the. Um, the short uh, fragment of uh, of RNA that's been generated, and then um, th the target mRNA is uh, is then uh, degraded. Um, the main difference in um, between uh, microRNA and uh, siRNA is that uh, microRNA is coded for within the cell's own genome. Uh, so once it's translated, it uh, it forms uh, the structure called uh, pre-miRNA, uh, which consists of uh, these short uh, incomplete hairpin loops of double-stranded RNA. Uh, these hairpin loops are then processed by, uh, by a protein called drosha, and this uh, cleaves the pre-microRNA, uh, which is then exported uh, from the nucleus into the cytoplasm, and there it's it's processed by the uh, by dicer and it undergoes the same uh, process as uh, as uh, silencing RNA. Uh, in addition, um, non-coding RNA can also uh, repress a trans a translation um, by recruiting uh, additional factors such as. Um, uh, methyl transferases. Um, so th they have additional functions besides uh, targeting mRNA for degradation. Uh, so just to, to clarify, mm -hmm. silencing RNA and, and microRNA disrupt translation, not transcription. Right, because you already have uh, the mRNA present at that point. I think I've also heard of, of RNA-induced silencing complex. Mm -hmm. Are you going to talk about that next? So it actually can, yeah. I, I do cover it somewhat, but. Okay. Um, yeah, keep going and then we okay. can talk about it because there is some evidence for them actually mm -hmm. silencing transcription as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, the next form of uh, short non-coding RNA is uh, PIRNA or uh, PWE interacting RNA. Um, so these uh, types of uh, non-coding RNA bind to uh, the PWE proteins, which are a family of proteins that uh, were initially discovered in fruit flies to silence uh, genes that are involved in germline function. Um, so the function of PIRNA is really specific to, uh, the, well, the majority of the research that's been done on it has been specific to uh, meiosis and uh, germline uh, function. Uh, so there are really, uh, there are two categories. There's packetine PIRNA, which is relevant to meiosis and prepackatine uh, PIRNA, which, um, which is relevant to the steps prior to meiosis. Uh, so uh, this type of uh, non-cutting RNA has uh, uh, transposon repressor functions. Uh, transposons are uh, are a type of um, are fragments of 
uh, the genome that are that are transposable, meaning that they can uh, they are pieces of DNA sequence that can change its position within the genome. Uh, it's also called the mobile genetic element. Uh, we'll go into a little more detail about that in a bit. Um, but one of the mechanisms mechanisms that piRNA uses is to uh, is it uh, recruits uh, methyl transferases to rep uh, to methylate transposon sequences, uh, and this uh, represses uh, the trans uh, the transposons. Um, um, and uh, now we're going to go into long non-coding RNA. Um, these are usually uh, 200 uh, nucleotides or larger. They can be generated by a variety of mechanisms, uh, including disruption of an open reading frame, chromosomal rearrangements, insertion of a transposon into a, a protein coding uh, gene, uh, which can uh, result in a functional uh, non-coding RNA. Um, one of the most famous examples of a long, long non-coding RNA is uh, EXIST, which is the X chromosome inactivating uh, protein, or not protein, uh, RNA. Um, so this is coded for on the X chromosome, and it, uh, it is, uh, basically codes uh, the, the, the uh, X chromosome that's going to be inactivated in a, in a female cell. Um, and then it recruits uh, methyl transferases uh, through a, a segment of, uh, of the RNA for just rep A. Uh, this, uh, these methyl transferases then silence uh, the, the X chromosome that is going to be inactivated. Um, and uh, this process is also down-regulated by another lo long non-coding uh, RNA called a T6, um, and this downregulates uh, transcription of the excess uh, long non-coding RNA. So there's um, a back and forth there. And um, this uh, occurs at, the inactivation itself occurs at random, but there's a lot of research recently that is suggesting that it's not completely random. So, um, but yeah, this is one uh, example of long non-coding RNA in, um, so, at least, sorry, mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt. Uh, mm -hmm. I just missed the part where you said about the back and forth between. So, the I understand about the X, X inactivation, mm -hmm. um, but you said there was something else that. Yes. Yeah, so, there's another that. long non coding RNA called T6, and that uh, represses transcription of excess, which is the long non coding RNA that inactivates the X chromosome. So, um, Essentially, the T6 long non-coding RNA prevents uh, X inactivation. I see. Thanks. Um, okay, and now let's go into transposable elements. So transposable elements, like I mentioned before, are DNA sequences that can change its position within a genome. Um, these are highly mutagen mutagenic, meaning that they can cause mutations. Uh, they can do this by targeting protein coding genes for insertion. Uh, they can cause chromosome breakage, and they can cause uh, genome rearrangement. Uh, they tend to accumulate in the heterochromatic regions of DNA, and they can be autonomous, uh, meaning they produce all the proteins necessary for transposition or non-autonomous, uh, which are elements that don't uh, produce all the uh, proteins necessary for transposition. Um, so they're categorized into three types. So the first type here is uh, retrotransposon. Uh, so these require a reverse transcriptase, uh, a reverse transcription step, um, and uh, they're categorized based on the presence or absence of a long uh, terminal repeat or LTR region at the end of the element. Um, this uh, type of uh, transposable element usually undergoes duplicative transposition, uh, meaning when uh, when it's uh, inserted into uh, a target, it, uh, it, uh, it's a, the segment that's inserted is a duplicate of another segment. Um, so they can accumulate uh, after multiple uh, uh, repeats of trans, uh, transposition uh, events. Um, type uh, two is, uh, is also known as DNA transposons. So, um, these are sequences that encode a transposase, um, and this recognize uh, the transposase recognizes uh, 
terminal inverted repeats or TIRs that are present on either end of um, the transposable element and it, it uh, cleaves the DNA at uh, the sites of the TIRs, uh, which then releases it from a donor site and it allows it to integrate into a target site. Uh, DNA transposons can exist as either autonomous or non-autonomous uh, transposable elements. So uh, trans, uh, an autonomous uh, DNA transposon contains both the TIR uh, regions uh, as well as the open reading frame for a transposase. A non-autonomous uh, DNA transposon uh, can refer to a sequence that contains uh, the the two uh, terminal inverted repeats, but uh, but surrounding a region of DNA that is uh, that is under transpo uh, transposase. Uh, so uh, a transposase would then cleave uh, this uh, segment of DNA at the TIRs, um, and then it would be inserted into a, into a target site. But there, there's no transposase open reading frame associated with it. Um, and the last type of transposable. Uh, element is uh, autonomous helotrons. Uh, so these are transposable elements that also uh, encode a replicase and a helicase. Um, okay. So uh, one example of uh, transposable uh, elements uh, in use is in, uh, in uh, generating antibodies um, in <clears throat> by uh, B and T cells. So, so this is referred to as BDJ recombination, which is a type of non-autonomous um, transposition, uh, involves the use of non-autonomous -aut uh, transposable elements. So this is performed in uh, B cells and T cells in vertebrates using, um, using a very specific uh, family of transposable elements. And um, <clears throat> these, uh, elements then undergo cell type specific uh, DNA rearrangements. Um, the proteins involved in this process are called uh, RAG1 and RAG2, and they're responsible for the DNA um, rearrangements. At, um, and they are based around, uh, around uh, what's called an RSS or recombinational signal sequence. This is similar to a term terminal inverted repeat uh, from the previous examples. Um, and the goal here is to create different combinations of BDJ uh, regions. So these stands for var variable diver uh, diversity and joining regions. Um, and this, <clears throat> uh, uh, and the goal here is to um, create a diverse set of um, immunoglobulin expressing cells. Uh, so, um, are there any questions about transposable elements or anything else related to epigenetics? Beyond generating um, different antibodies and a diversity of antibodies, mm -hmm. what what are some other functions that? Okay, so um, the second half of or second third of this uh, session will be on uh, model organisms. Um, so model organisms are defined as non-human species that can be used to study biological phenomena. Some features that they typically have in common are that they're usually easy to uh, genetically manipulate. Usually they're easy to grow in laboratory settings. Uh, and normally they have genes that are homologous to humans. They usually have some relevance to some human disease. Um, not always though. Uh, the majority of them also have uh, uh, databases where all their genetic information is compiled. Uh, and these, this information is also viewable on several other uh, browsers for genomic data. Um, so I'm gonna be talking a lot about yeast, um, probably more so than the others because I've been working with yeast for most of the last decade. Um, and there's gonna be a couple of multicellular um, examples of model organisms that I'm going to leave out, but I'll include uh, the links to their, to their uh, associated databases. So if you are interested in those two, um, you can check those out as well. Um, I also won't be covering uh, cell culture or tissue culture, but if you're interested in that, we can definitely include that in the next session. Um, okay, so we're going to start with the prokaryotic or, or unicellular model organisms first um, because they're simpler. Um, and I'm going to start with uh, the only prokaryote that I have on my list, which is E. coli. 
Uh, the main benefits uh, with working with E. coli is that it has a very short doubling time, about 20 minutes, and it's easier to grow it in large quantities on nutrient media. Um, in addition, we uh, have uh, non-pathogenic strains that are generated for lab use. Um, this is the link to the E. coli uh, genome database. Um, and uh, in terms of what research has been accomplished with using E. coli as a model organism, uh, as you can see, there's been a lot. So this includes uh, research on gen uh, molecular biology and genetic mechanisms um, in pharmaceuticals, uh, evolution, and genetic engineering and biotechnology. Um, in addition, E. coli is also frequently used in labs for, um, for techniques such as uh, generation of plasmid constructs and uh, things of that nature. Um, so most labs, even if most molecular biology labs, even if they don't use E. coli as, as their main model organism for performing research on, they still have E. coli strains for the purposes of um, constructing uh, uh, plasmids or, um, uh, yeah. yeah, mainly for constructing plasmids. Um, the next uh, unicellular uh, model organism I'm going to talk about, I'm um, actually going to cover two of them, but um, they're both very similar. Uh, so there are two types of yeast that are commonly used in labs. Um, one is called Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is budding yeast. Uh, this is the same organism that they use to make bread and beer. Uh, the other one is Schizosaccharomyces pombe, which is also called fission yeast. Um, it is not as cool as um, budding yeast, but I'm a little biased. Um, so these are <laughs> unicellular eukaryotes. Um, uh, so cerevisiae was the first eukaryote to have its genome fully sequenced. Um, Schizosaccharomyces pombe was the sixth, which is another reason why cerevisiae is the cooler one. Um, they're both uh, very genetically tractable. Um, so um, I may have mentioned before that I'm not totally knowledgeable about CRISPR. The reason for that is because with budding yeast, it was, depending on what you're working on, it's actually not even necessary because it's so easy to manipulate it uh, genetically. Um, so uh, both uh, budding and fission yeast exist in, um, either a haploid or a diploid form, um, they uh, both have two mating types. Uh, and budding yeast is called A and alpha, and uh, pombe, it's, um, it's plus or minus, or PNM. Um, so because they can exist as either a haploid or a diploid, uh, this uh, allows for generation of mutants through mating. So um, if you want a combination of mutants within the same strain, you have two haploids, each one has a has a mutation at one of the one of the genes of interest. If you mate them, and then you uh, you uh, perform a, a process called tetrad dissection. Basically, you take the diploid uh, that's uh, created by this mating event, and you grow it up, and you separate. Um, you uh, force it to undergo sporulation. So you have four haploids. You then separate the haploid cells and. Um, and from there, you should have um, a, you should have some haploid cells that have both of your both of the mutations that you want. Um, another way of genetically modifying yeast is through homologous recombination. Um, so yeast has a has a unusually high rate of homologous recombination. So um, what is commonly done is uh, exogenous DNA is uh, generated by PCR. It um, and this PCR fragment usually has some uh, some overhangs at either end, uh, at, at both ends actually. And, and these um, contain homology, usually about 20 to 40 base pairs worth uh, to the genomic DNA of the cell that is being uh, inserted into. Um, and, uh, and then uh, the cell can just take up this exogenous DNA and integrate it into the genome based on where uh, those uh, homologous regions are. Um, uh, this is also aided by the use of oxytropic markers. So uh, the majority of yeast strains are defective for amino acid synthesis. Um, and usually when, uh, when a piece of exogenous DNA is uh, put into a yeast cell, it comes with, a, with an amino acid marker. Um, so typically, uh, so a, a typical yeast cell, for instance, wouldn't be able to generate it's uh, synthesized its own tryptophan. But if you 
um, put in a mutated gene and you attach uh, the gene for tryptophan biosynthesis in it, and you grow this, uh, you grow these cells in a media that doesn't have tryptophan in it, it will still survive. And that's how you know that your mutation of interest has been integrated. So, um, so that's uh, another example of uh, genetic tractability in yeast. Um, um, can I just for a sec? So, so surely that's like uh, antibiotic resistance when you're working with E. coli. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rather than rather than putting antibiotic resistance in, you put this amino acid uh, biosynthetic pathway in. Yes. I see. There is also one antibiotic that also works with yeast. Um, it's called G418. It's this, it's similar to kenamycin, it's my understanding. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, usually when we do tagging, it's some kind of amino acid. Yeah. Um, so um, a lot of the early work using yeast um, involved the use of large scale screens where uh, the a large group of yeast cells where they underwent random mutagenesis, and from there they um, were put in conditions where um, where the cells would undergo some kind of stress, and uh, the cells that were uh, that um, were able to grow in uh, during while in those stress conditions were um, were differentiated from the ones that did not uh, grow under stress conditions, and after sequencing of those cells that were defective for um, defective in those um, stress conditions, that's how a lot of the uh, a lot of uh, genes in yeast were identified. So one, uh, so the major example of that is the cell division cycle genes or the CDC genes, so, which was um, the hallmark experiment that kind of put yeast on the map as um, as one of the major model systems for cell cycle um, research. So. These were randomly mutagenized um, so, uh, cells that were um, that were then grown, and um, cells that were arrested at certain stages of the cell cycle were identified, um, and they were then sequenced, um, leading to um, the identification of about uh, I think about seventy genes that were involved in regulating cell cycle progression. Uh, similar. Uh, example of, uh, of a large scale screen was the radiation uh, sensitive screen. So these, uh, you can usually tell uh, what screen a gene was uh, found in based on the first three letters of the gene name. So every gene that was identified by the cell division cycle experiment is starts with CDC. It's actually really confusing because when I was doing my PhD, I was working primarily with a gene called CDC55, but at one point it interacts with another gene called CDC5. Uh, led to a lot of confusion. <laughs> um, yeah, so I ended up just using the long term names for some of them just to just to give my audience a break. Um, another example is the radiation genes that would start with rad. A lot of these are related to cancer. Um, these are the uh, these um, genes when mutated uh, have defects in the cell cycle response to radiation and DNA damage. Um, so <clears throat> so even though it's, you know, this little unicellular um, yeast, uh, it's um, a lot of the genes that we study in, um, in cancer were originally identified uh, uh, in this organism. Um, on that note of uh, why it's, so, it's been so big in cell cycle research, um, a lot of that has to do with the fact that because it's, uh, it can exist as haploid or diploid, the mating pheromones of the opposing uh, mating type can be used to synchronize large uh, cell cultures. Uh, so for most labs usually use mating type A for cerevisiae. Um, so what they do is they use uh, the pheromone for the mate for, that comes from mating type alpha cells, and they use it to synchronize large cultures so that all the cells in a culture are in the same phase of the cell cycle. Um, and the way they confirm this is through morphology, which is um, a one, which is probably the main reason why yeast is um, so useful in cell cycle research. It's, um, it's one of the few organisms where you can tell exactly where the cell is in the cell cycle just by looking at it under the microscope. Uh, budding yeast in particular has this uh, characteristic shape um, 
when it's in G1 phase where it only has one a copy of DNA, it's just a circular shape. As it enters S phase, which means when DNA replication starts occurring, it starts uh, generating this bud, which then grows until it's ready for, my, for mitosis, um, at which point it forms this uh, characteristic dumbbell shape. Uh, uh, Schizosaccharomyces pombe has a similar um, morpho morphological change across over the course of the cell cycle, but um, it, it is a different shape and it undergoes fission rather than budding. Um, but similarly, you can identify where a cell is in the cell cycle by looking at a microscope. Um, so uh, both of these organisms have uh, their own databases. Um, so Saccharomyces cerevisiae um, data is all on yeast genome and yeastgenome.org and uh, uh, Schizosaccharomyces pombe uh, uh, data is all in pombase.org. Uh, and the last unicellular uh, model organism I'm going to talk about is Chlamydomonas. Um, so this is a photosynthetic unicellular algae. It has an eight to 12 hour doubling time and uh, similar, similar to yeast, it can be uh, large cell cultures can be synchronized, um, but rather than using a mating type pheromone in Chlamydomonas, you can use light exposure. Um, so because of this, um, one area of research where it's useful in is circadian rhythms, uh, which is um, the study of activity and response to light and, uh, light and uh, dark cycles. Um, it's also um, used um, in research on plant cell biology and evolution um, because a lot of uh, the genes that are present in Chlamydomonas are similar to those in, uh, in mammals. Uh, it's a, there's a lot of interest in uh, amongst chlamydomonas researchers to determine uh, where that diverge, where the divergence between plants and other eukaryotes uh, occurred. Uh, it's also um, another uh, area of uh, research interest is ciliary disease, which um, includes uh, diseases that uh, that affect the airways and uh, and kidneys in humans. Uh, the reason why uh, Chlamydomonas is especially useful in this research area is because the genes that uh, that are involved in in uh, controlling the creation of the cilia in chlamydomonas are very similar to uh, the genes, the, the homologous genes in humans. Uh, and I don't think chlamydomonas has its own specific database, but there's a database called Phytozyme, which includes uh, uh, data on uh, multiple uh, plant uh, organisms. Um, and we're going to go into multicellular organisms. So unlike unicellular organisms, multicellular organisms can also be used to study uh, development, cell differentiation, and cell-cell signaling. Um, so the examples I'm going to go through are Arabidopsis, which is uh, another plant. Um, uh, C. elegans, which is the roundworm we were talking about before, Drosophila, which is the fruit fly, and uh, mice. Um, so Arabidopsis is uh, the most commonly used model system in plant biology. It uh, is notable for having a short generation time, and um, again, it's um, easy to genetically manipulate. It has a smaller genome compared to other plants. Uh, it has about 26,000 genes. And its genome is enriched for gene regulatory proteins uh, more so than other eukaryotes. So that's one area of interest um, in terms of uh, uh, what's, what type of research it's used for. Um, and again, it's uh, the database um, to use for Arabidopsis is phytosome. Uh, phytosome. Um, so uh, plant biology isn't really my area of expertise, but I know Jeremy is involved in open plants. So uh, my understanding is to work with local works. I was wondering if you could talk about that for a bit. Yeah, uh, we're working with uh, Marcantia polymorpha, which is the liverwort plant. Um, it's, it's as much as I understand about it, it's, a, it's really a very primitive plant. It doesn't really have roots and leaves. Um, it can repro uh, reproduce either um, asexually or sexually. Um, well, it doesn't produce seeds, it produces in these little cups um, called gemma cups uh, that are uh, on the phallus, which sort of looks like a leaf. 
um, these little, I guess, little balls of cells, and they're knocked out by rain or wind, and then they um, create a, you know, genetically identical water plant. Um, and what we're trying to do with it is we're trying to get it to express insulin. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, right now we're working on getting it to express a reporter protein mm -hmm. called Ruby, uh, which is um, the protein or the gene sequence that uh, produces the red color in beets. Mm -hmm. um, you were using yellow fluorescent protein, but um, you need a fluorescing microscope to look at that to see it. Um, so that's a little um, <clears throat> uh, awkward. Uh, we mm -hmm. had to rely on Dave Jackson's lab at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory <laughs> to, to determine whether we had transgenic plants or not. Mm -hmm. So uh, so we're actually in the midst of the molecular cloning mm -hmm. work right, right now, trying to get that to work, uh, which is fun. It's uh, learning some molecular biology techniques now do them. NEB kits, it's all about the NEB kits. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then we get stories from Dave about how they used to do it in the old days. Oh. How they used to do plasmid prep in the old days, before they had kits, which was interesting. Um, what did, I'm kind of curious well, about what did, yeah, he said that they, well, they used ethidium bromide as the stain, as the staining agent. Uh, that will fluoresce under UV light, but mm -hmm. um, we did um, uh, density gradient. So they would put cesium chloride on, in it, which is apparently a nasty substance because mm -hmm. it's a heavy metal mm -hmm. and uh, spin it in a 100 G centrifuge for, couldn't remember, it was like 12 hours, 24 hours for a really <laughs> long time. And then you and then you get these density gradient gradients. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you, oh, well, first you have, if you've got E. coli, you've got to lyse it. So, mm -hmm. so you have cellular debris, then you have the chromosomal DNA, you have, and then you have the plasmid, which could be linearized, linearized, nicked, or covalently, uh, or, or supercoiled, supercoiled, and they'll all separate out in different fractions. And then, and then you visualize it and you stick a hypodermic needle into the layer that you want and suck it suck that out to get the to get the plasmid so now you just mix a bunch of things in kits in a kit yeah. and spin it in a centrifuge with a microtube and microfilter what is it called microtube microfilter i can't remember and then and then you've got a few drops of, of purified dna it's a lot easier yeah, so yeah i consider was, myself lucky to be a biologist in the age of uh kits yes right right but, um, yeah, so take my money, NEB. Who said yeah. that? Is that that? Yeah, yeah, that was me. LOL. <laughs> take my money, NEB. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I think NEB was started by a Cold Spring Harbor um, person. I, I seem to recall Dave mentioning that. So a lot, a lot of people from there have gone on to start companies and make lots of money. Biotech. Okay, so um, go back to C. elegans, which we kind of covered already. Um, yeah, so C. elegans is a type of roundworm. Uh, it was the first multicellular organism to have its full genome sequenced. Uh, it was also the first organism to have its embryonic cell lineage mapped. So. Um, starting from when it's <clears throat> when it's uh, an egg up until its adult stage, uh, the lineage of every single cell has is already known, which is um, makes it really useful for studies in development uh, and in uh, meiosis. So um, it's also the only organism that so far had has had its full neuronal wiring diagram completed. Um, so that's another area of research where it's um, really useful is um, the study of uh, it in, um, is, uh, is in neuroscience. So the study of uh, neurological diseases is uh, another, it's an area where you see a lot of C. elegans being used. Um, so uh, as I was talking before, one of the advantages is that it exists as both hermaphrodite or 
or as a male. So it can be self-fertilized or it could be uh, crossed uh, or a hermaphrodite can be crossed with a male, uh, which uh, gives a added layer of um, control over, uh, uh, over it genetically. It can also be maintained in a starved state at low temperatures for an extended period of time. Um, this has also been useful in the study of autophagy, which is a process of um, just a type of cell death where, um, where uh, cells essentially eat itself in, uh, in response to um, starvation. Uh, so that's another area of um, research which is used. Um, and it's also easy to grow on, uh, on agar plates that are coated with bacteria. Um, this is also um, how it's um, how RNAi is used using um, in C. elegans. It's uh, taken up from uh, the bacteria on the plates. Um, yeah, and the database associated with uh, C. elegans is called the WormBase. Um, so uh, I saw a comment in the chat box about uh, nomenclature. So yeast and C. elegans both uh, follow, a, they follow a similar system where it's usually three letters um, followed by a number. Usually the first three letters have something to do with the function uh, or how, or when it was, uh, or the experiment where it was, uh, where the gene was discovered. You can usually tell if a gene was discovered in Drosophila or fruit flies, uh, if it's a kind of a wacky name. Uh, one example is the hedgehog gene. Uh, if you made it, Hated the flies get spiky like hedgehogs. That's where the name comes from. There's also a member of the hedgehog uh, family of genes called Sonic. Uh, you can sometimes tell how old a person in your lecture audience is based on whether or not they laugh when they first hear um, the term Sonic Hedgehog. Yes. I had one professor um, bring that up and then follow up with, oh, you're probably too young to know what that means. Like, no, I'm actually about the same age as the hedgehog. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, so Drosophila um, is, uh, again, it's a type, of, it's a fruit fly. Uh, the, uh, one of the advantages to using Drosophila in research is that it has a short generation time. It takes about nine days to go from egg to adult. Um, it has four chromosomes and about 14,000 genes. Uh, one of the characteristics of Drosophila that makes it uh, unique is that it has uh, giant chromosomes with distinct bands. So this um, is useful in studying uh, uh, studying uh, chromatin uh, reg regulation and modeling. Um, so here uh, is an image of uh, one of the uh, of uh, chromosome extracted from uh, Drosophila salivary gland. So here, the areas that are uh, puffed up, uh, those are the regions of high transcription. Uh, the areas that, uh, that are more narrow, those are areas that are not uh, actively being transcribed. Uh, so, um, and another uh, useful uh, feature of Drosophila is that um, it's also really useful in, uh, and studying tracing of gene expression and body organization. So you may remember this image from Shruti's presentation last week. Um, so, uh, so gene expression can be traced over the course of uh, embryonic development. Um, and you can see that uh, different genes are expressed at different time points and in different regions of the Drosophila embryo. Uh, so this is, um, really good example of how um, gene expression is controlled over time and over space in an organism. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, database for uh, fruit flies is called Flybase. Definitely check that out if you wanna see some funny gene names. Um, and the last organism I'm gonna talk about is uh, mouse. Um, so this is a mammalian organ model organism. Uh, as you can see in um, this diagram of, of evolution, it is uh, very close to humans. Um, so this is uh, this diagram represents the percentage of amino acids that are identical in in a protein that they're using as an example here as hemoglobin uh, alpha chain. Um, you can see that uh, humans uh, and mice are uh, they're 
about 89% uh, identical for this protein. Um, so um, about 80% of all mouse genes have a single identifiable ortholog in the human genome. Uh, mice have uh, 40 chromosomes, somatic cells, uh, and about 30,000 protein coding genes, which is about the same as humans. Um, another benefit of using mice is that uh, strains of humanized mice can be generated for therapeutics research. So humanized mice are mice that um, contain some form of some something of a human origin, such as uh, such as uh, DNA or a, a tissue graft or a tumor uh, or parts of the human uh, microbiome. Uh, and these mice can be used to, uh, to, to evaluate uh, compounds used for therapeutics uh, and the associated uh, genome database link is here. Uh, and there were two that I didn't cover because I'm not that familiar with them, but they are also commonly used um, model organisms. So uh, those are zebrafish and uh, xenopus, which is a type of frog. Um, so uh, if you want to check those out, those are the links to uh, the databases. Uh, any questions about model organisms? <laughs> 